Hi, my name is Celestine Ananda, and I am a third year undergraduate physics major at Carthage College in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And I am going to be presenting a uh, simulation that I'm relatively proud of that um, satisfied a requirement to use an ordinary differential equation solver to solve a problem uh, for, to meet the requirements for a computational physics class that I'm currently in. So I decided that it'd be interesting to tackle how long it takes for certain objects in orbit to decay enough that they are considered deorbited. De because the, it's actually a huge problem um, in orbit around the Earth right now. There are millions of pieces of man-made debris and micrometeoroids that pose huge threats to satellites as well as the International Space Station and therefore um, astronauts actually performing um, extravehicular activities. So even uh, the tiniest little piece of space debris, like even a paint fleck, can cause catastrophic damage. NASA's estimated that a one centimeter paint fleck is capable of inflicting the same damage as a 550 pound object traveling at 60 miles per hour on Earth, which is a huge problem if we have millions of little micro satellites essentially in orbit. Um, all of this space garbage poses huge threats to rockets going up into orbit and for new satellites that are being put out. So just to show, this is an image from window number seven of the International Space Station and it's an orbital debris impact um, on a service module. So. I'm not sure how close this actually was to breaching, but if this, if this had breached, it would have caused huge problems for any astronauts or any pieces of equipment in that module. The cabin would have depressurized and they probably would have had to remove the astronauts and make repairs. It would have been catastrophic. Um, and if this would have been a slightly larger or a more massive chunk of space debris, it could, that very well could have happened. So I want to see how long it would take for, say, a paint fleck to deorbit from low Earth orbit. So I put together a few chunks of code that will t solve this question crudely. So I started by just importing the necessary libraries that I needed, and probably a little bit extra too. So the first um, thing that I wanted to delve into is that the force of drag on an object that causes it to burn up will increase as it gets closer and closer to the earth because the air density will, uh, the air will become more dense. So in order to capture this, I've taken data from the MSIS E90 atmospheric model um, from the earth's surface all the way up to a thousand kilometers in orbit. And I put this into a function using the interp1d command. All right. So here we have the initial conditions that are currently set up for a paint fleck, but could be set up for just about anything you'd want. Um, so just 400 kilometers is about low Earth orbit. Um, estimated the mass and the surface area for this paint chip. The only thing that's really kind of just a shot in the dark is the coefficient to drag for the paint chip. Um, this is just kind of a run of the mill number, kind of in the middle. Um, so then also the initial velocity I gave it was in the x direction for about 8,000 meters per second. Um, and that's about average low earth orbit um, velocity. So these other ones, I wouldn't change, uh, recommend changing these. You could change the mass of the earth and the radius of the earth if you wanted to consider a different planet, but then you'd probably also want to change the atmospheric data. Um, if you really want to go wild, you can put yourself in a different universe and change the gravitational constant, but I don't really think that'd be very meaningful. All right, so then these are further initial conditions. Um, a few of them just need to be non-zero. These are ones that kind of take what the user inputted and just clean them up a bit for the simulation. Um, here, one thing to point out, the max time that um, we'll be going for is for one month. So this is just the number of seconds in a month. If you were to increase this value, if you wanted to go to two or three months, you'd also need to increase the number of steps by about that same uh, coefficient. All right. So this is our initial state vector, which we will use in our function, I'll describe in a second, with the x and y positions and the velocities in the x and y directions, which we just defined prior. And then the time array, which is just linear, which goes, as I mentioned, from zero 
to one month with our number of steps. All right, so this function does the heavy lifting, it unpacks the state vector, which is passed in, into position and velocity. We calculate the force of gravity with a fudge factor. Um, this is just the typical gravitational force equation with all of our variables. And then this fudge factor looks very big, but with how the, the, these numbers we're using are pretty large, so this is actually as large as it needs to be. We then calculate the altitude, just based on our uh, where we are minus the radius of the Earth from zero. And then we calculate the force of air with quadratic drag and using our density function that um, is imported using the interp1d command as well. So, and then we divide the altitude by a thousand and multiply by a thousand because this data was given in grams per cubic centimeter and we are using kilograms per meter. All right, so this is our change in state uh, per change in time. And this gives the velocity in the x direction, the acceleration in the x direction, velocity in the y direction, and the acceleration in the y direction. Okay, so for our function, we're going to be returning our changing state vector if we are no if we are still considered in orbit, which we're considering 100 kilometers above. If we're below 100 kilometers, we're then returning zeros because we are considering that the debris is incinerated, which is a rough estimate. It's not terrible. Okay, so we run an ordinary differential equation solver, ODE int, with our function, which we just talked about, the state, which we talked about prior, and our time array, which we talked about prior. Okay, so we can then plot um, the results of the ordinary differential equation solver and see what the orbital pattern per se would look like for a paint fleck in orbit. One thing to keep in mind, this is set up for a 2D system, not 3D, so you aren't perfectly capturing what the orbit would look like, but this is giving you a rough estimate um, if, if the Earth was flat. <laughs> uh, regardless, um, this is pretty, pretty accurate, besides for the fact that it would look like a typical orbit around the Earth. So, um, what you're seeing here, the blue circle is Earth. This is the center of the Earth. We are starting right about here, and then going around, obviously around and around and around for a month, actually a little bit less than a month, and then it appears we have reached the 100 kilometer point here, and we are considered that the paint fleck has burnt up. So it appears that within one month, with these initial conditions, the paint fleck is no longer causing a problem, but during that month, it could have catastrophic effects on satellites. All right, so with this, we can just check and make sure that this actually does hit and that this isn't just where it stopped. Um, so what I have here is a chunk of code that will run it for two months. Do the exact same calculations, but for two months worth of data. Find the minimum distance from both, which um, was done up here for the first one. Calculated the minimum distance from Earth in kilometers, and then did the same thing for after two months. Found the difference in these numbers and then decided that I mean, it's not perfect because we're not capturing the change in altitude anymore, but we can decide that the initial altitude minus 100 is the total distance we need for the orbit to change to be considered burnt up. So if we divide that by the quote-unquote average of um, the change in orbital altitude for a month, we can use this to figure out the months it will take to deorbit, roughly. Okay. So we ran this and it'll take about one month or zero years to deorbit for a chunk of space to debris with all the initial conditions we defined. I just included this um, year's calculation in case you wanted to rerun this code with some of your own numbers. All right, so now we're going a little wild. I wanted to see, I wanted to run the simulation for an object that was bigger, that had a more stable orbit and see what kind of numbers we'd get. So let's see how long it would take with these crude estimates for the International Space Station to deorbit. So I found data uh, for the ISS on NASA's database, which if you want to look into, I have here. And so we have the starting altitude, which as they say is the average altitude that it orbits at, um, its, average, its mass. Uh, coefficient to drag here is kind of just shot in the dark, but um, it's, not, it's not very aerodynamic. Um, so then the surface area I actually calculated with the solar panel surface area and then estimated the ISS module surface area based on images. And it's pretty much almost all 
the solar panels. Okay, so again, factors we wouldn't want to change. Uh, resetting the number of time, the amount of time we'd want to run. And then, so we do the exact same thing we did before, run it through ODE int. And we find that this is an image of one month worth of the ISS's orbital pattern. So it has an uh, interesting eccentricity based on these calculations. And using the same method before, we found that it would take about 176 years for the ISS to deorbit based on these really crude calculations. But regardless of this being a relatively mediocre um, way to analyze how long it would take for debris in orbit to fall back to the Earth, um, I'm relatively satisfied with these results. Um, I don't think that about a month for a paint fleck is too outlandish, and I don't think that the ISS uh, calculation is too outlandish either. If this had been less than maybe, maybe less than 25 years, I'd be a little concerned, and if it was over maybe 500 years, I'd be concerned too. Granted, this is giving myself a huge amount of leeway for a decent number, but it's not staying indefinitely in orbit, and it's not falling immediately. So I think we've done, I've done a few things right here. Granted, it's not perfect, but I really enjoyed this. I had a lot of fun. I got to make ODE in to actually flex its muscles a bit, and I really enjoyed this. So things I'd like to work on is actually for this um, estimating how long it would actually take, I want to better include the changing atmospheric data instead of just going off of the first month. Because in the first month, it'll be pretty far away from Earth. The atmospheric, the atmosphere is going to be very thin. Um, so this isn't really great. It would take, it'd be much better if I could really include the changing atmosphere. So that's something I'm going to work on. But regardless, this isn't terrible. Um, I've had a lot of fun with it. If you'd like to look at it yourselves, you can change, like I said, these are fun initial conditions to change. You can get some really wacky eccentricities and it's pretty fun to see um, what to, it gets a, it gave me a much better feel of what to expect for satellites and why they have the, why they go to the altitudes they do and what makes an orbit more stable or more non-stable. So I really enjoyed this, it was a fun project, and thank you for your interest.